Have you been unleashed? Unleashed. 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 Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Horizon Advisors Unleashed podcast. This is Andrew Henricks. Back at it again. Welcome back, everybody. Ryan, welcome back. Hi. Joined here by hey, my Andrew. partner, Ryan Cuss, as normal. Um, how you doing? Doing great. Yeah. Just uh, We just went to the, the fish store and... Uh, Got some supplies, some new snails for our uh, office fish tank. Yeah, the uh, fish tank's been doing well. Got uh, got the fish back in there. The corals are good. If you've ever been to our Plymouth office, downtown Plymouth here, we have a nice uh, saltwater coral reef fish tank in the lobby. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's good work. It's a lot of work, but it's great. It's rewarding. Um, and it's uh, surging with life right now in the whole ecosystem is surging, so yeah, it's good. It's exciting. Good maintenance. Um, need a couple more snails to help clean up a bit, but um, not here to talk about the fish tank. We are talk- We are talking about something more uh, fun, I guess, on the side of things. Um, this is kind of to continue some of our lifestyle uh, theme uh, podcast genre, per se, that we've been doing more, f- more recently, um, and we wanted to talk about uh, a trip that we both got to go on. Uh, most recently, actually, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, many of you uh, are probably familiar with the Masters, the big golf uh, tournament down in Georgia, Augusta, Georgia. Um, obviously, for it being renowned for its tradition, um, very difficult course, um, the competitive nature of all the big golfers, right? That's the that's the one. Yeah, I don't really know if if you were a golfer, if you had to pick one of the majors to win, I'm assuming that would be the one you would want. But, you know, for people who are more into that stuff, maybe there could be an argument for another one. But at least from the outside looking in for just uh, kind of like a more amateur golfer, uh, it seems like the Masters is the big one that it's everybody wants. one of wants. the big ones to win. And um, very renowned, again, for tradition, all these other things. So we were uh, had the awesome opportunity to be able to go. We... Uh, myself and Ryan and two of our other business partners, Terry and Matt, went with us who are big golfers, and uh, we were able to go to the practice rounds. Um, We didn't go to the main round that started Thursday and went through Sunday, Uh, but we did go to get to the practice rounds, which was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, and get to see all the, you know, the big golfers uh, practice, watch watch them play the course, and uh, attempt many different shots and see how the ball rolled on the green, uh, if, if they hit it there or here, and uh, the famous skipping the water, um, yeah, that was whole, whole, whole sixteen, um, you know, so a lot of lot of cool things going on, um, and you know, it was just it was an incredible experience. It's it's very difficult to get um, to get tickets. Um, you have to be basically in a lottery type pool, um, and to to be invited, you can't just buy tickets on uh, StubHub or Ticketmaster or other places. You um, you have to kind of be invited almost or win the lottery of tickets. So uh, it's very exclusive, which is another reason why the glamour of it uh, makes it a little unique. Um, But we just wanted to talk a little bit about the trip and uh, some of the stuff that we got to see and maybe throw a couple of fun facts in of Augusta. If you aren't familiar with uh, the course and what it's all about, uh, we have a a couple of fun facts we can share too. So uh, before we jump into that, I guess, you know, I'll pass it over to, to you, Ryan. Um, what did you think of the trip? I mean, it definitely did not let me down. You know, it's been kind of one of those things that's been on my bucket list uh, for a long time. I've watched the Masters for years. And one of the things that's always impressed me the most with that course and the tournament uh, is, you know, the quality of the course. I mean, if you've ever watched it, you know, on TV, you know, the birds, you know, the water, the greens, everything is just like perfect. You, when you're walking out there, sometimes it almost feels fake. Uh, so yeah. one of the things I really enjoyed was, you know, we probably walked, I'd say maybe 10 miles a day. It's heavy undulating course, ups and downs, you know, a lot of hills, like way hillier than I would have ever thought. 
uh, but just the pristine quality. I mean, the level of detail. I mean, you look up in the trees, like you, you couldn't even find like a dead branch on a tree. I mean, it's meticulous. Uh, I found that very fascinating. I will have to state for the record um, that I did find a weed mm. uh, in Augusta. Uh, I don't mean to get anybody in trouble, but jokes aside, uh, Ryan's point is true. Uh, obviously, the you know the landscaping and the shape that the course was in, with all the with all of the the flowers and the trees and everything was was immaculate. Um, I do joke because I did find a weed on on one of the holes. Um, like on the kind of like on the cart path, and I was looking down, and we were joking about like would would we find something that is like out of place, like a a dead tree branch or something like that. And long and behold, there was a a little weed um, in the grass there that I found. Um, hopefully, I don't get in trouble. I did pick it. I was trying to just do my duty, do my do my service to Augusta. I pick a lot of weeds in my own house and my landscape. I do it myself. Can't so, help yourself, um, you know. So I know how to do it, but uh, I had to just give a little. Uh, a little help to to the Augusta National there, but uh, other than that, um, I mean, it was basically yeah, what, what, immaculate. What was the story with uh, the grass there? They do it once or twice a year. Um, I think you I think might be tr- uh, you might be thinking they do do it Augusta. I think what you're thinking about is Sage Valley, which okay. is a golf course nearby, another club. Um, but they, Augusta does still does something like that. They basically reseed it. Um, I don't know if it's once or twice a year, but they. You know, they essentially, I might not be using the right terminology, you know, so spare me for that, but they basically, you know, the grass basically kind of gets like ripped up and they redo it is my understanding. Um, so that it's in pristine condition every single time, uh, it might be done once or twice a year. Obviously they're down in the South. They don't have like as harsh of winters as we do up here in the North, but, um, they do something in regards to basically pulling up the, pulling up the grass and then reseeding it. So it grows again which is crazy when you think about it. I know that you golf courses do that, um, but it's much, uh, much longer, like maybe once every couple of years or five years or something that yeah. they do something like that. Um, a little fun fact. I mean, when you're walking the course, I mean, you don't even really see, I mean, there's cameras, all kinds of, you know, electricity all over the place and you don't see wires. They have all kinds of underground infrastructure under the course, you know, to house a lot of this, I think they have a whole underground ventilation system that, you know, helps keep the dirt and everything kind of at the moisture level they want for good grass growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we had a we had an interesting conversation with uh, one of the gallery members who's been there for been doing it for a long time. I can't remember. Um, his name was Lee. Shout out, Lee. Um that was on our first day there. We actually, again, because there's, there's no phones. I guess I'll put a pin in that for a second just to remind everybody. One of the big things about the Masters is that you cannot take your phone in. Uh, you can have a digital camera on the practice round days when we were there, but you can't have cameras either um, during the main round. So uh, one of our buddies who came with us had a digital camera, so we were, to, we were able to snag some photos, but um, not allowed to have your phone. So when you go in, you check your phone. Uh, if you have it on you, you have to check it basically like at a coat check. Um, you know, at, at a, in a place, a fancy place, or if you're at a, a sporting event, you want to check your coat, very similar to that. Uh, so you can't have any phones. So when, if you're in there, you know, all day, you, you got, you got no phone, you're, you know, you're out of pocket. It's, it's just like the good old days. They have these little, uh, phone sections with, uh, the old landlines, little, basically like little stalls, like eight or nine in a row. They have little sections scattered throughout the course where you can pull up the landline just like the old days and type in a phone number and call that way. Um, but no mobile phones. So, uh, and, and there's, that's the rule for everybody. I mean, yep. you don't, you don't, the caddies and players were the only phones we saw. Correct. Um, you know, which, which, which certainly makes it interesting. Um, but you know, one of the, one of the big things with going back to the gallery and Lee, we were talking about on the first day, you know, again, you don't have any phone. Maybe if you have phones or you're doing that, you're on your phone, you're making calls or whatever, you're not taught, but you have to talk to people. Um, and there's a lot of people there, so there's tables, and if you get your little food and you get your pimento cheese sandwich, which mm. was definitely worth it, by the <laughs> way, um, ten out of ten. Um, you gotta, you know, you gotta maybe share a table with someone, and you know, you're you're talking. You actually have to talk, talk to, to a stranger. Isn't that crazy when you think about it? Um, 
So anyway, we one of the gallery members who are essentially those people, if you don't know, those people are the ones who stand basically on the holes where there's the walkthroughs and they're the ones that put the ropes so that, you know, if a player's coming through, you can't walk through the hole, you have to wait. Um, they also know directions and they can help point you in certain areas and all these things. They're, they're basically kind of like a helper. Um, and and everyone that we talked to was very nice. Uh, but we were talking to him and said, hey, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. You know, what are some, you know, unique or cool things that maybe – you know, you said you you should do. Obviously, the 16th hole in the water, where they, on the practice rounds they try to skip it over the water. We'll probably talk about that in a second. But the other thing was he talked about the landscape. Now, I I like Ryan and I both like landscape and flowers and making yard and everything look pristine and nice. Uh, we really enjoy doing that. Um, so obviously, that was something that was I already knew about Augusta was how beautiful the landscape was and the flowers. Azaleas and, specifically. Yeah, that, you know, the blooming azaleas, that's what you see on the, you know, the ESPN, the CB, CBS when they promote the Masters. That's what you see, the big pink flowers. But they have, like, I mean, it's a crazy, I mean, they have like a 80-some thousand plants there, all different types. And he was telling us that there's actually a, I think it was a Chinese fern, I think is or, or Chinese fern tree or something. Again, I might be special wrong. Special tree. A very special tree on hole 14, I think it was, that... People who get invited or win the lottery and come and get the tickets, they go and see this tree. <laughs> you know that that's what they're coming for ultimately. I mean, obviously they're still gonna have fun and, and watch the golf, but they come to see and, and take a picture of the tree in the practice rounds because uh, there's like only one in the United States. Something along those lines. Again, I don't have the facts exactly. Maybe it's on my little sheet here that I'm gonna bring up. Um, but the reason why that's also I'm bringing that up is that he said, "Hey, well, you know, if you've never been here before and you like this." you know, go up through hole one. There was a big sign that said through one and there's a big path. And he said, well, why don't you go walk up that path? Cause there's Straight all uphill. these beautiful flowers, all these different on both sides of you. It's an uphill, uh, r- little road. Um, and there's all these different flowers and it was, you know, it was really nice. I mean, it was beautiful. Um, and there was all these different types of species of plants and, and trees and, and flowers and they were blooming. And, um, you know, to have that on a golf course, and again, you can really appreciate the beauty. I mean, you're like taking me- mental pictures, right? Because you don't have a phone. I mean, we had a digital camera, but um, it was just really cool and unique, um, that piece of it, that that was non-golf related. Um, and how they connect that to golf is every hole at the Masters is named after a plant or a shrub or a tree that is either like on that hole or, 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 or close to it. You know, um, like for example, I think, I think it was hole three um, that was like called like flowering crab apple. You know, that was the name of hole three um, because they're flowering crab apples on hole three. Uh, so every name of every hole, they each have a specific name and it's named after that, which again, it, it gives appreciation to the landscaping and how pristine they keep it um, and how immaculate it really is. Yeah. I mean, even if you go to some of the nice country clubs here in Michigan, you know, you're lucky to probably get just a really nice green or a really nice fairway. I mean, this golf course goes so far that you could like walk through the woods and it, it just looks fake. Like every inch of that property is manicured. Yeah, I mean, you could really tell. <laughs> um, but, you know, for it to hold the traditional standard of everything that it does, I mean, it's um, they have to do it that way. Um, you know, some of the other unique rules, um, that were there that we found, you know, we found out again, we didn't, we didn't find out cause we were doing anything wrong, fortunately, but we saw maybe other people or something else happen is, uh, no backwards hats. I mean, that's kind of common for a country club anyway. Uh, but you know, there were people that like flip their head around and we would see like the security of the gallery members like, Hey, you know, flip your head around. Um, there was you couldn't run. That was another big thing. There no sprinting or no running allowed. Like if if you got let in uh, when the course opened, like you can't sprint to run to the hole to get the best to get spot. the best spot. Like it's supposed to be very. I mean, when we were on the par three tournament, which is you know I think a good segue for the next thing to talk about. But on the par three tournament, everyone's near like the you know the clubhouse and and there's hills you can sit on to watch. And people were laying down like on the hill to be a little relaxed. And there was security and gallery people walk around being telling people to sit up because they don't want people that's not the look they want they don't want to be people about lounging around and sitting because the party tournament is recorded and you know um you know it's on i don't know who who streamed it who had the rights to that but it is on tv so 
they don't want people laying down and having that look, which I just thought was interesting, right? And they just they take the rules very seriously, um, so much so that if you break the rules and continue to be a problem, that you are banned for life and you're not invited back. Yeah, which <laughs> so, you definitely don't want that. No. Um, That's embarrassing. You definitely it's, don't want it's that. It's more about being like a gentleman, about just doing the things that we basically know. One of the other things I found interesting, it's like one of those rules is if you're a member, if you're fortunate enough to be a member of Augusta, mm -hmm. which I think there's probably only two or 300, I don't think they really make that number known, but you actually have to um, do a service during, during the rounds where, you know, you could be Peyton Manning, you know, put on a green jacket and you have to basically walk around and help and, and give some service mm -hmm. to the course. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time regardless of who you are so yeah so you you're walking around the course and you're kind of looking for those green jackets because you know you know it's probably someone pretty important at the end of the day well and they remember you know that yeah. somehow some way and they're doing their they're doing their service and um it goes back to the the patron term um you know they don't they don't call like the people that show like fans or members or anything they call them patrons, patrons. um you know that term is used Again, it's it's like beaten into you to a pulp. Um, they're they're very very specific on what they call the people there, which are patrons. Um, you know, and it just all goes back to again the kind of like the tradition and being a gentleman, being a lady, and um, the sophisticated nature of it. They take it very seriously. Um, so you know that aspect of it is cool. It didn't. I I wouldn't say it, there was no part of it that that seemed like it was. Uh, you know, a, a bird up tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no, nothing that no. would. Yeah. It was just, it's just nice. And it's refreshing. It's a very unique experience in that regard. Um, so only positive things to say for that. Um, saw a lot of, you know, they plan their spring break at high school. You know, they do it a little bit later to coincide with the masters. So you got a lot of high school students out there, you know, working the concession areas, you know, out there helping, just kind of adds to the fun yeah and it's because there's so much traffic and so much so much going on i mean it's basically you know funding the you know the entire economy of augusta you know for like one week or two week period it's crazy how much uh business and everything comes in because of that tournament um and they got the service on lockdown i mean they i mean give you an example you go into the men's bathroom you know somewhere where you know, most guys don't need any help finding a stall or anything like that, but they had people in the bathrooms, you know, pointing out, you know, empty urinals, empty stalls to keep the line moving, to keep everything moving quickly. And that's, that's one of the things I noticed about the course and everything that was kind of going on. Everything, you know, had its own little processes and systems to keep, you know, the crowds moving, to keep, you know, the experience good. Yeah, very, uh, they have it dialed in. Um, I know from the information we were shared, there was a new area this year that was added on that we were at that had a new um, restroom facility, had a new uh, concession stand, and I think there was a little shop at that spot. I'm not sure. Um, but there was a new area that was basically like a brand new build. That's actually where we are talking to the gallery guy. Um, and it's just crazy how automated and efficient they have. Even in the concession stands, you know, there might be, I don't know, maybe four four or five lines, yeah, but, each one. but, but if, when you go down the line, each side of the line has the food, you know, the drinks, the snacks, everything grab in a row. and go. And there's, I don't know, for each section. So if you're going down one line and then there's, you could either pick and choose from your right or your left. There was probably five to 10 people working each one of those sides. Yeah. So there's like 20 a row, maybe, maybe more. And they're just literally just putting out sandwiches, uh, filling up another beer and putting it there, filling up another gator or, you know, whatever the drink was there, um, you know, and putting those out and just, and it's just a constant cycle, boom, boom, boom. And so you just walk in, grab, go, check out, boom, walk in, grab, go, check out. It's like, there it's was all honor system. You tell yeah. them what you got, which yep. again, kind of felt interesting. And the other piece of it is no logos, no brands, no anything. So if you wanted to get, you know, the light beer, it's in a master's cup. The domestic. And it was just called domestic light beer. So I don't I don't even know what domestic light beer it was. I have no idea. It could have been, 
Coors Light. It could have been Labatt Blue. Light. I have no idea what it was. Um, it was good. It was just domestic light beer. And then there was the other ones. It was like, uh, you know, a more a thicker, heavier beer, like maybe like a Blue Moon. But it was just called, I don't even know, beer. Yeah, <laughs> and the beers beer. were six bucks, and you got a you got mm-hmm. like a take home cup with it too. So I mean, you know, you go to any big event nowadays. I mean, you're paying. 10 15 bucks for a beer so that was kind of oh mean, the, the detroit sand- lions stadium it's the like, sandwiches were like a dollar 50 to three bucks i think the pimento cheese sandwich was a buck 50 i could have eaten like 20 of those um i think the real i think the new thing i'm telling you, I, I someone's had to have done it before me i can't say that I, but the barbecue pork sandwich mm. with the pimento cheese the combo a bite of both that might be something I don't know if I'm breaking any rules by by doing that, um, but the hybrid of both. Uh, but yeah, I think the pork sandwich was what three dollars. Yeah, they keep all the prices, you know, like almost like the same, or it doesn't. They don't price with inflation or whatever they do. They they it's it's almost like again uh, part of the tradition that they have. So all of these little things, when you've, you've never been there, you've seen it all. It kind of all comes full circle, and it's cool to see. They don't need to make money off the concessions. They got such a demand for yep. all the uh, apparel. Oh, my gosh. I guess we should change that subject yeah. now. Um, yeah, the gift shop. Crazy. Um, literally crazy. So I guess I'll start with the fact that they have these special gnomes. Uh, if you've been or heard of the Masters it, or if you've researched it all, they have these special gnomes that are different every year, and it's become a thing where – now getting the gnome is a big deal. Um, limited. Lim- yeah, so people wait to get in to basically rush, no running, but rush to the gift shops so they can be one of the persons to get the gnomes because they they're only they only put out so many per day. And there's a big gnome. They're like garden gnomes, but they're dressed up like in caddy uniforms or like a, a green jacket or whatever it is, and they're different every year. And we didn't even have a chance to get one no, <laughs> no, no chance we woke we, up we, too yeah late. but um there was a big one and a small version and they also had a beach towel that was special there was like a green and a pink one but then there was this special beach towel that was mm-hmm. in the same category as the gnomes and people are fr- and then barring that that's just one piece of it but just during the day no matter what time you went the gift shop line was absurdly I mean, long. I think we waited a half hour to 45 minutes to get into the store. But, and we thought that was long, but we were talking to people, some people waited like an hour, two hours, even three and hours, they said, it perfectly, to though. get in because of this. I mean, so it's crazy. And you go in there and it's like, it's a madhouse. Free for all. Madhouse. You get, you finally get in and it's a- Hundreds of people rushing around to grabbing get everything. all their stuff. Just- yeah, yeah, and you're just filling a bag, like you're just stuffing. And it almost gives you a sense of I mean, urgency. It does. Yeah, we had we yeah. had to we had to rep our little gear for today. This is from the Berkman's place, which we'll cl- we'll close on on that in a second. But we had to rep it for the podcast today. Um, but the gear is awesome, and it's people. You know, even my uh, my fiance, I brought her back a, a little quarter zip jacket. Uh, you know, a female one with uh, a female hat too. And she was just on a a business trip to Arizona and she wore the hat and she said no no more people have ever talked to her like in regard, like, oh my gosh, did you go to the masters? Did that hat? I love that hat. Where, you know, were you there? And it's like, she was like overwhelmed with how many people have commented (laughs) on just because of it being the masters gear. Um, But that's how much in demand this gear is. I mean, it was crazy in there. It really was. Um, for a sporting event gift shop, I've been to a lot of sporting events. Nothing has been as yeah. crazy as that gift shop. And I guess um, it shows you the economy maybe is still ticking away. I mean, these people are spending, spending, spending. So the consumer looks strong there, at least. Yeah, probably a certain percentage of people there. Um, but for that for that genre, sure, definitely still spending. I can see it firsthand. Um, so the gear was cool, of course. Um but, you know, one of the things I wanted to speak on the, the unique thing of the practice rounds that kind of everybody talks about is the, on the last day, there's a par three tournament. So uh, there is a par three course uh, that's kind of by the clubhouse and you go around. And, and that was where we were referencing the security guard telling people to sit up. Um, but there is a little uh, par three tournament on day three of the, pra- the final day of the practice rounds where uh, the golfers can participate and like their caddies are like 
you know, typically their spouse or their girlfriend or their kid or their, you know, mother, father, sister, you know, family member, a friend, you know, stuff like that where they, their caddy is someone that's related or special to them. Um, and they caddy for them during the par three tournament and they have the kids running around in little caddy uniforms and, and stuff like that. And, um, you know, there is a winner. Ricky Fowler is the one who won it. Um, Good the, golfer. The par three tournament winner has never won the Masters. Uh, fun fact, I found I did find that out. Uh, so once Ricky Fowler won, unfortunately, we knew he wasn't going to win, uh, which was true. Uh, that streak has continued. Um, but it was really it was a cool experience. You know, it was, it was more laid back. It was fun. A lot of people were there for that. Um, and you could tell how special it is for those golfers to bring mm -hmm. out their significant, you yeah. know, others and go have a little fun on the course and they get some of the attention because, you know, when you're a golfer, I mean, all the tension's on you. What are you doing? Yep, it's true. And, the, you know, CBS was there, ESPN was there. They were interviewing. We were showing pictures. You know, it was just – it was a fun experience. Um, definitely the busiest part of the practice rounds for sure. Um, uh, but it was still really cool to to see that and, and, and uh, experience it. Um, but, you know, that's a cool thing about the practice rounds is that par three tournament's pretty famous. So, yeah. Um, you know, other than that, uh, we didn't go to the main round, so, you know, Thursday we left, but we had, you know, a great time. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, we we did go all day. We walked a ton. Uh, great workout. Again, it is it is a lot more, I know Ryan mentioned it earlier, but it is a lot more elevated than you think. Um, you can read about it or see it on, you know, the TV and say, oh, wow, look at the elevate. you know, look how much. But it, and if unless you're there and you're actually walking it, um, it is a workout for sure. Um, and just, I mean, that's the other thing is walking. I mean, of course it's difficult. You can tell that there's difficult shots, but until you're there and you see, you know, you're walking where the golfers are having to hit and stuff like that. I mean, I wouldn't even imagine how hard I'd shoot like a 200 on that course. Yeah, it would be, <laughs> be very difficult to shoot under a 120. Um, I would try, but, um, yeah, it, it's the greens were just there's just you could just see even from how far we were from the greens, which were still close. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, pretty far from being able to tell what's going on. You could just see how much movement there was on the green just with the, the hills. And, the, you know, it, it was that's why we saw so many golfers practicing. I mean, they would they were purposely shooting pitch shots and chip shots to certain parts of the green just to see how it would land if they hit it there, they weren't even target. You know, they weren't trying to target for the hole or anything like that. They were just they wanted to see the roll. They wanted to see the roll. They wanted, and then once they got up there, they took 10, 15, 20 different putts from different areas to see what would happen if, you know, if the pin location's there that day, how is that ball going to fall? Um, and they're marking all of it. It's just cool to see the actual practice. It's something that I haven't really seen before of, you know, the, the actual steps of what they're doing to practice for the round. Um, you know, definitely more relaxed and laid back, but still very serious, um, which I think kind of gets to almost kind of like the concluding point, which is talking about the winner, um, talking about serious. Um, Scotty Scheffler, who dominated. On fire. Um, obviously, he, you know, he was basically leading the entire time, not the whole time. I know DeChambeau had a nice run there in the first couple of days, but he was in, he was in the lead or in that, conversation for the entire four days three days um played super consistent even with all the uh you know th the thursday friday had bad weather it was super high winds there was some rain that first thursday that delayed the start and then friday was extremely windy and then saturday it died back down everything was kind of fine but that's when people really started to kind of not collapse but started to get a little wobbly um you know, and he just remained constant through all those weather conditions, all the change of it. He just stayed. And I will say that being a couple feet from him um, at the practice rounds, you know, again, he was, he was, you could see he was more relaxed and having some fun too with the pairings that we're with, but you could also tell just how serious he was taking it the whole time. Um, and it showed when he performed, you know, that he just, he dominated. Um, he's the number one in the world for a reason as it was a second win. Uh, which is cool to, you know, you know, say that, you know, we were there, we weren't for the main round, but we were there, we saw him and we were, we followed the winner for, a, for a couple holes. And, um, you know, he just, he looks dominant out there right now.
not a lot of mistakes. I mean, that's that's the other grueling thing about this is, I mean, you got a difficult course. You got the pressure of, you know, being on TV and, and the fans just, you know, mobbing you. I mean, layers and layers of people just watching every little inch of your shot and to just consistently go out there and just drop money shot after money shot, not making a lot of mistakes. I mean, that's, that's why he won. Yeah, and you know, and and speaking of the winner, I did want to share a couple like fun facts with the whole green coat because you know at the end of the day, the the famous thing if you don't know golf or don't know anything, you might know about the green coat. That might you because that's the ceremony that the winner and the previous winner from the year before is the one that puts the green coat on the new winner. Um, you know, so that's like that's the tradition, that's the big ceremony. Um, and you know, we'll share this. So there's this just a uh, from the Augusta Chronicle. <laughs> Um, there's a little fun, fun 25 facts. We can share the link. Um, but the tradition, it says the tradition of the members wearing the green jackets began in 1937 and the jackets were purchased from New York's Brooks uniform co. And the idea was that, so the, the master's patrons could easily see the members who would have accurate information or someone who was a member or one. Um, that was the whole purpose was for them to be able to see them easily um, originally again we're going back way back you know disregard cell phones landlines all that I mean this is way back um, so you could find the person you kind of needed to because you know that they know the deal um, and then one thing I I didn't know about this but just reading more about the masters I thought was unique is that after the round is over I did know there was a dinner but I didn't know the specifics of it um, the champions dinner so Scotty Scheffler would have been there in this case for sure um, and then John Rahm, who was the one who won last year, um, he was one that put the coat on Scotty this time because he, that's the tradition. The champion's dinner is for members of the Masters Club, those who have won a Masters tournament and is hosted by the defending champion. So I didn't know that last piece of it. So not only does the, you know, the um, previous winner from the year before do the green coat ceremony and put it on the new winner, but they're also the person that hosts the dinner after the round. Um, again, all these little kind of fun facts, but they're, it's all tradition. Like all these things, it's just so tradition based. And I think that's why it's been held to such a standard and why it's so such a important and kind of like a bucket list item for everybody. So yeah, and when you look at anything that's been going on for a long time to keep the traditions going for that long and not really going in the other paths or trying to change things. I mean, I can't really think of too many things that, that have held on that long. Yeah. Um, really cool experience. Um, obviously there's so much that we could talk about and share about the whole trip in general, but just Augusta national in general, it, it definitely met the expectations of what you think. Um, it was a bucket list item for me as well. Maybe one day I'll make it to the main round. We'll see. Um, but the practice rounds were a lot of fun. Um, and you know, for all the golfers out there who like golf and are appreciate these things, it definitely was a very unique and kind of dreamy almost experience to be able to be there and see all that. And, with all the tradition and everything and being involved in it definitely makes it appreciated even more. So, um, a lot of fun. Hopefully we can make it back. Yeah. Never know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, cheers. I'll take it. Cheers to a good trip and, um, appreciate everybody listening. Um, and, uh, we'll see you all next time on the podcast. Thanks everybody. Disclosure, Ryan Cuss, President, Financial Planner, Alexander Dinzer, Managing Director, Financial Planner, Andrew Henricks, Financial Planner. Securities and advisory services offered through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC, a broker dealer and registered investment advisor. Satera is under separate ownership from any other named entity. Tax planning services offered by Horizon Advisors. Tax and accounting services provided by Horizon Advisors CPA. Satara Advisor Networks nor any of its representatives do not provide tax nor accounting services. 
The views stated in this podcast are not necessarily the opinion of Satara Advisor Networks, LLC, and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities. Due to volatility within the markets, opinions are subject to change without notice. Information is based on sources believed to be reliable. However, their accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investors cannot invest directly in indexes. The performance of any index is not indicative of the performance of any investment and does not take into account the effects of inflation and the fees and expenses associated with investing. A diversified portfolio does not assure a profit or protect against loss in a declining market. All investing involves risk, including the poss- possible loss of principal. There is no assurance that any investment strategy will be successful. Distributions from traditional IRAs and employer-sponsored retirement plans are taxed as ordinary income and, if taken prior to reaching age 59 and a half, may be subject to an additional 10% IRS tax penalty. Converting from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA is a taxable event. A Roth IRA offers a tax-free withdrawals on taxable contributions. To qualify for the tax-free and penalty-free withdrawal of earnings, a Roth IRA must be in place for at least five tax years, and the distribution must take place after age 59 and a half or due to death, disability, or a first-time home purchase up to a $10,000 lifetime maximum. Depending on state law, Roth IRA distributions may be subject to state taxes. There is a surrender charge imposed generally during the first five to seven years that you own the contract in an annuity. Withdrawals prior to fit age 59 and a half may result in a 10% IRS tax penalty in addition to any ordinary income tax. The guarantee of the annuity is backed by the financial strength of the underlying insurance company. Investment sub-account values will fluctuate with changes in market conditions. An investment in a variable annuity involves investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Variable annuities are designed for long-term investing. The contract, when redeemed, may be worth more or less than the total amount you invested. Variable annuities are subject to insurance-related charges, including mortality and expense charges, administrative fees, and the expenses associated with the underlying sub-accounts. Investing in mutual funds is subject to risk and loss of principal. There is no assurance or certainty that any investment strategy will be successful in meeting its objectives. Variable annuities, exchange-traded funds, and mutual funds are sold by prospectus only. Investors should consider the investment objectives, risks, and charges and expenses of the variable annuity, mutual fund, or ETF carefully before investing. The prospectus contains this and other information about the product. Contact Alexander Dinser at 5455 Corporate Drive, Suite 210, Troy, Michigan, 48098, or 248-265-6662, to obtain a prospectus, which should be read carefully before investing or sending money. Again, Horizon Advisors, 5455 Corporate Drive, Suite 210, Michigan, 48098.